Suppose I am holding a ball. Here I am, a stick figure, standing on the ground. And I'm holding a ball and then throw it up in the air and move my hand out of the way so it comes back down and hits the ground. So I might imagine that motion on paper by, by putting a, a series of dots. It goes up in the air, comes back down, and hits the ground. Now this is such a familiar experience for so many people that uh, that's pretty sufficient. I, I know what's going on here. I could say things like, well, I know the velocity is upward to start and on, on its way up. It's downward over here. So I can describe the velocities pretty comfortably. In fact, I could say at the very top, the vertex of this path, I could say the velocity is zero. And I'm pretty confident in that. I mean, it just makes sense because I see stuff like this all the time. I have a good intuition. But if I were to ask another question, let's say about the acceleration. What's the acceleration happening everywhere? That's not as easy to, to tell, and um, unless you've been exposed to physics, many people might, might have a misconception and guess the wrong answer. In particular, a common thing that ends up being a misconception is what's the acceleration at the vertex? The velocity is zero, but what's the acceleration? Now, we'll, we'll get into this in more detail later on in the course, but what I want to emphasize here is that even in simple motion, let alone very complex motion, in simple motion, we need to be careful. We need to have some process to be careful about thinking about it and uh, having a method, a problem-solving method, to be able to determine different, different things about this motion. And so we start by creating um, models okay, and, and, a, and a process of analysis. So a model, in this case, we'd call it a particle model because if I'm trying to just think about the motion of this ball going up and down, do I care that it's a tennis ball versus a racquetball? Um, not really. They're going to have about the same motion. Um, do I care that it's round? Not really. A, a, a block, a, a wooden block, the same, you know, would have about the same same uh, trajectory as well. So I don't care about details about the shape and size of this object. I just care about where it's at, and so I can reduce it to a point. And so part of my model is to say, I'm going to assume this object is a particle. Okay. I only care about where it's at. And often we'll talk about its center of mass. Um, but even then, we don't really care. It's just where is the particle at? Um, so this could apply to a car, a bus, an airplane, a planet even. I just care about where it's at, not its shape. Now, in some things, that's not going to be good enough, which we'll explore later on as we build up our problem-solving method. Okay, some other things about it is we can think more carefully about this motion and think of it in terms of time steps. We can assume some set time step. Okay, this is that delta I've introduced you to. That delta means a change in time. So that might be a, a t4 minus a t3 set times that are separated by a set time step or an interval. Okay, that would be the same as, as t2 minus t1, or t1 minus t0. So if we assume a set time interval, then we can consider where is this ball at at certain time intervals. And with that constant time interval, we then would be able to relate things like the velocity and the acceleration. Okay, so a better way of drawing this, instead of a bunch of dots like that, we can assume uniform um, position. So I could draw it here, and then let's say at a later time interval it's here, and a later time interval it's here at the vertex, and then at a later time interval it's here, here, and then at the ground. Okay, And now I can say, oh, I know something about this is a little bit more concise or, or quantitative, descriptive, than this. This is just kind of generic path. But now I could say this is at zero time, so this is t0 and t1 and t2 and t3, t4 and t5. So I know their times and I know that the time intervals between them are the same. Because that time interval is the same, it allows me to say things about velocity and, and acceleration once I have determined their positions and displacements. So for example, the displacement between here and here is it's the distance between the two. 
it went that far. And then this one went that far, that far, that far, and that far. And we can now use, these are all our displacements. I know something about velocity. I'm going to write that down. The, de the velocity is the displacement over the, the change in time, the time step. Remember, this is a constant, so it's like 3 or 2 or just some number that's convenient to the problem, but it's not changing. Now, delta x is changing each time. Delta x is this big for this between these two times. It's smaller between t2 and t1. So that means v is smaller between t2 and t1 than it was between t1 and t0. And the velocity here between t4 and t5 is even bigger because the displacement is bigger, yet the time interval is the same. So these lines both represent the delta x value. They can also represent the v value. And so I could write here a velocity there. And since it's, we have a tr uh, tradition of describing wherever the tail of this, this arrow is, as the value it's of its um, or the reference for it, so I'm going to say that's v0. This would be v1 and v2, v3 and v4. And I can now look at those and say those are all the same. Now I do need to be careful because the the actual picture here, if I've drawn it on a grid paper, those would be lengths, which would describe displacement. The the units would be displacement. Here, their relative lengths are all the only thing that's actually useful. They only say these are accurate relative lengths of velocity because the time step is uniform. But if this is two centimeters on the page or, or, or a meter in real life, that's not the right length for velocity. That's only a physical length of displacement. So, but the important thing is their relative lengths. I do know this velocity is that much smaller than this velocity because the displacement is that much smaller than this displacement and the time interval is fixed. So that allows me to do uh, a little bit more quantitative reasoning for, for this. And so we call this a motion diagram where we draw the object at different locations separated by a uniform time step and then we start labeling the velocity vectors and then we will also add the acceleration vectors, which I'll wait for a different video.